Okay. <laughs> we have the voice. So, um, yeah, good morning. Uh, at this uh, session uh, that will be dealing with uh, renovation and um, rehabilitation of uh, sustainable heritage, and I think we will be dealing with that in uh, in a different ways uh, in this uh, in this panel. Um, let me first introduce myself shortly. So I'm uh, Koen van Baalen. I'm from University of Leuven in uh, Belgium, uh, and I've been involved in quite different uh, European projects dealing with uh, cultural heritage. And also at a certain stage, I was involved as a member of the scientific uh, <coughs> panel of the GPI cultural heritage, setting up the first uh, research agenda. So the new one is uh, quite uh, aligned with what was happening in, in the past. And I think it has a number of very interesting uh, ideas. Um, just as a kind of an introduction, I think it's important to uh, bear in mind the context in which um, we are looking at this uh, heritage and the importance of heritage in a much broader uh, context. Um, and one of the elements that is uh, to be considered, according to me, and one of the reference elements is a publication that helps us to look into it, is a document that you can find on the National Trust website in, in the UK, uh, which is uh, which has as a title "Places That Make Us." So it's important to understand how cultural heritage, of course, as we will be discussing here, in terms of durability, is not only a matter of material, it's not only a matter of energy, but it's also a matter of people, society, and well-being and context. And I think one easy way to refer to that, maybe slightly different is uh, looking at who won uh, recently, I think a few days ago, the Pritzker, Pritzker Prize, and so the Nobel Prize for Architecture. Um, it's uh, Francis Cairé, I guess the first African to win it. And if you read what is stated in, in the reason why he get this Nobel Prize in architecture, is exactly the fact that he is dealing with local architecture, traditional architecture with local materials, and with society. And he sees architecture, for example, much more as a process than as an outcome. And bring that in the context of rehabilitation, I think uh, an important aspect of that is temporality. I think we sometimes, in the field of heritage, we are very often associating heritage with eternity, long duration, but I think that very often this is making our life very complicated. Instead, if you look at things as temporary use, if you see things as a, cons a sequence of uses, a sequence of adaptations, I think our way of dealing with heritage is probably much more sustainable. Uh, finally, I would like uh, to bring in a number of other elements, the one uh, which is also present in the Cultural Heritage Council for Europe report that you may know. Uh, and one of the, we have contributed to that uh, report, which had a big influence, I think, in Europe on the way how we deal with heritage, cultural heritage, is to understand how cultural heritage is the resource to make things more sustainable. Even if you have other plans, if you are and looking for other outcomes, uh, aligning with cultural heritage, and that's what we demonstrated in the reports, make this these efforts much more sustainable and lasting. So we are here in this uh, conference. I think it's the basic, let's say, the, the basic title of the conference, of course, looking at uh, in which way uh, heritage um, through science can help us to understand what heritage is about, and at the same time, looking at how science can help preserve that heritage not only for the preservation and the sake of the preservation of that heritage itself, which of course is important, but also to understand and its, its contribution and contribute to the efforts that um, we should deal with in the context of the preservation. So I think we have four speakers in, uh, in this panel. Uh, and we will start with uh, Dorian Bianco. Uh, he is, uh, I think there are some slides where I think we can proceed the slides can you just try if to go on yep okay we have, we have the list uh, of different so that's me uh, but then we can go to the next and so dorian banco he is as you can see a phd student at um, andre chastel center in the sorbonne university in france and um, yep i think you can present your contribution and let's keep it in 10 minutes 10 minutes 
Thank you for this presentation. I'll speak about the 20th century architectural heritage and thermal rehabilitation of buildings, and uh, more specifically about uh, post-war heritage in France. And as an architectural historian, my expertise is not technical, but rather historical. So first, I will start with the social and economic context of the post-war period that explained the logic of mass building and the large-scale planning of infrastructures. And uh, first, we had the scarcity of available materials in the 1940s, then improvements of living standards and demographic boom. And that actually triggers uh, a breakup in terms of building methods with the gradual adoption of uh, pre prefabrication methods, uh, notably based on concrete. And in the wake of the first oil crisis, energy savings became a new challenge that retrospectively pointed out many defects in terms of thermal performances. But on the other hand, uh, today, we have since in the 1990s uh, the need to implement an ecological transition that seeks to prevent the effects of global warming. And the reports filled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have established a broad scientific consensus that CO2 emissions uh, actually caused by human activities trigger those, this uh, global warming. And this finding is a turning point that introduced a new political ecology that deeply differs from the previous ecological thinking, notably in planning. If we, if we had uh, previously the organic city praised by Patrick Gillies, the Garden City of Ebenezer Howard, the notion of milieu de vie in the French human geography, and then later bioregionalism. Uh, at this time, ecology thinking was understood as a reconciliation between men and their environment. This is what we could call a human ecology. But the current emerging ecology, on the contrary, seeks a new goal, which is reducing and withdrawing all CO2 emissions in order, in order to decarbonize human activities. This is what I call a functionalist ecology. Uh, and it means that every program of transition is a function of decarbonization. And among the basic solutions, uh, decarbonizing human activities imply notably the thermal rehabilitation of buildings. Recently in France, uh, uh, one method became mainstream. This is the Renovation Thermique uh, Globale, in English, the global approach, notably established by engineers like Olivier Siedler from Enertec and also the Association des Gawatt, uh, that aims at reaching the uppermost thermal performance. This, this is the Niveau Bâtiment Basse Consommation in French, not just by changing the heating system, but also substituting the finishing works, windows, doors, insulating walls with weatherproofing materials and favoring external insulation of facades. This is uh, the ITE, Isolation Thermique de par l'extérieur, that avoids thermal bridges. And such approach is actually widely supported in France by the Ministry of Ecological Transition, also governmental bodies like ADEM, Agence de l'Environnement et de la Maîtrise de l'Energie. And this is actually a kind of top-down governmental support. And this is why I call this ecology actually a technocratic ecology. And I mean the concept of technostructure established uh, by the American economist, John Kenneth Galbraith. This is the, the use of engineering expertise in management and here in public management. So here we have a few examples of this clash between uh, the lack of consideration toward architectural and historical values of building and, uh, and, and the, the approach of global renovation. Here we have, for instance, La Montagnette, built by the architect Fernand Pouillon in Avignon, in which we find uh, a, a modern architecture mixed with uh, the features, traditional features of stone facades and low-rise Mediterranean roofs. And here you see uh, an external insulation, the substitution also of finishing works that expresses a lack of careful consideration uh, of the post-war architectural integrity. Here also uh, two other examples, um, Les Orques de Flandre, uh, here in Paris, built by the German architect Martin Schulz van Trek, here on the, on the right. Uh, we have here the Fug Tower, and uh, there was, uh, uh, in 2017, took place an external insulation uh, uh, that actually changed the original colors of the cladding. And we have uh, and also another example here on the left, uh, uh, which is the Tournuage built by Emileo in 1976 in Nanterre. And there is, a, there is a currently an ongoing project of uh, uh, external wall insulation on some towers that would radically change 
the architecture with a new cladding of stainless steel instead of the original mosaics. Here are two other examples. On the top, uh, the, uh, the ordinary built heritage of the post-war period here in uh, Le Portel. It is a, 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 a city that in northern France that displays a very coherent uh, true story townhouses with typical post-war structural articulation. This is Modern Nature in French, uh, rustic bossage. And we have here, for instance, on, 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 on the right, an installation with PVC and a substitution of, uh, of the war of uh, doors and windows that triggers a downfall of architectural qualities. And we have also the problem of individually based uh, re uh, renovation. And, and at the bottom, uh, another example in the suburb of Rouen in Normandy, with 1950s collective housing, uh, with the traditional cladding of the Pays de Cour on the Rouen vernacular architecture with red brick and silex walls. Here we also have an, out, an external wall insulation that actually uh, breaks the architectural integrity. So uh, uh, the, the question is, what do we do? Uh, because the problem is that improving thermal performances of this heritage is absolutely necessary to get energy savings by lowering the prices of energy and avoiding uh, the use of fossil fuels. The question is how to preserve the architectural integrity of substantial parts of the recent built heritage. How do we reconcile those apparently irreconcilable goals? And we must observe some technical uh, paradoxes with, with the model of the global renovation and the notion of high uh, efficiency. First, the very high numbers of construction work that you would have to carry to reach uh, uh, what Negawatt Association uh, calls for roughly 80% of the built environment uh, insulated uh, with this method. You would have to, so many buildings to uh, insulate that you cannot carry uh, each renovation work on a case-by-case -case basis, but you have to develop prefabricated methods of insulation with prefabricated components. And what the Association Negawatt proposes is actually an industrialization of renovation. And also, secondly, the global approach needs a lot of materials for external insulation. You need joists, infills, cladding. You need to substitute doors, windows, railings, and also you need uh, sometimes to put a new artificial ventilation system. All this process brings to the construction work a lot of materials and you risk making the CO2 emissions on the global carbon footprint increase. And the carbon footprint of the construction work is not actually included by the studies of Negawatt for, uh, for the moment. It points out another problem, which is the durability of thermal uh, renovation. We know how to restore traditional facades, but how how do like do we know how to restore facades made of PVC? And how many years can such external insulation last? All those questions uh, are still raised. And finally, we have what we call uh, the rebound effect, the effet rebond in French. It means that when we get energy savings and it becomes less expensive to put the heater on, inhabitants tend to warm up their houses even more. If, if it costs like 20 degrees to warm up at 22, so many people prefer to put the heater at 22 instead of 20 for the same price, which cancels the expected impacts of energy savings by thermal insulation. And it actually, it neglects not just heritage, but also the social and human needs, because uh, um, uh, building and housing are, are, in this perspective, mostly seen as a purely technical tool to implement uh, uh, thermal performances, and it, neg it neglects the cultural and the human, the sensible uh, dimension of housing, the way people basically live. Uh, and because there is actually not one universal solution, but there are actually diverse solutions reflect, re reflecting the diversity of heritage and also the diversity of ways of life. So for the conclusion, I would say that I see some solutions to implement an ambitious thermal re rehabilitation of building, but I think it is very important to carry out a non-systematic, but a case-to-case -case investigation of buildings, integrating human and social needs and also architectural values before the thermal renovation works. And to adapt the methods uh, to the preservation of heritage, it means not always wall insulation, but prim primarily the substitution of the carbon intensive heating system and the use of low carbon energy sources. And here you have a very rare example of uh, interesting, in my opinion, external insulation carried out on a post-war heritage. Uh, this is the Auguste Doron blocks uh, built by André Lursa in Saint-Denis. 
built between uh, 56 and 62, in which the English-like bricklaying has been reproduced, still displaying the concrete articulation, the modern nature in concrete. And uh, I wonder if uh, the general volumetry hasn't changed a bit. So uh, I want to say that we don't need to bring ecology into culture, but I think we need to bring culture into ecology. We need also to end, in the French context, uh, the silo thinking by closer cooperation between heritage services and govern go governmental bodies in charge of ecological transition. It is important to get a prospective vision of heritage protection as also a tool to decarbonize human activities also, and I think we need to strengthen the role of heritage architects in this process. And here we reach uh, the long-term problem of the uh, uh, ongoing and the current separation between engineers and architects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorian. Just a few key words I would like to recall on, on, the, on your presentation. And I think it refers to my little introduction about saying maybe architecture and rehabilitation is more a process than an outcome and a result. And I think uh, you have been referring to uh, a very holistic understanding. So I think what you say basically by saying maybe it's about culture in ecology and not about ecology on itself. So taking away the silos uh, between the disciplines. And uh, of course, we have tools uh, which can help uh, to make that work is, for example, life cycle analysis. Uh, so that's also going beyond uh, only understanding the, the amount of carbon dioxide that we are using for heating, but to understand the whole life cycle is a, is a very different story. And I think that's uh, what you also were referring to, questioning what is the durability and uh, even the carbon dioxide cost of this insulation process, uh, uh, beside the one that we aim to save. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So then uh, we can move to uh, Julien. Um, and... Um, um, so Julia has uh, had a PhD on Paris Est, if I read it well, and um, yeah, you're working as a, as an architect and uh, doing some research. research, and I think therefore we will, I hope we'll still see a little bit more of the practical concerns. Thank you. So we consider the existing building, the existing housing building as the main heritage to be rehabilitated by combining architectural enhancement and thermal performance. These buildings are part of what we call ordinary heritage. In other words, it refers to a minor production that was first built without an architect for a long time until the 19th century. We can affirm the fact that different historic housing types compose the main part of the urban fabric. De Jean Marin's positioning wants to question the assessment of Cesare Brandi, who considered in his Teoria del Restauro the ordinary destined only to be repaired, which would exclude it from the heritage uh, field deserving restoration. I will rather speak about re rehabilitation of the ordinary heritage, understood as the re-establishment of a building in the esteem of its inhabitants and of the public by valorizing and improving its qualities and uses. The presentation is based on the analysis of six projects by the Jean Marin architect, most of them completed or in progress. In the first part, I will explain how the office works from the structural and heritage uh, component of the existing building and uh, the potential that it offers. Then I will consider the transition from diagnosis to design and the ability to go beyond the quantitative objectives of energy sobriety. Finally, I will expose what we can learn from the work sites in inhabited uh, environments. Oops. The first group, uh, the first project is a group of buildings constructed on the medieval plot on Rue Saint-Denis in the center of Paris. The composition is uh, typologically complex. We worked over time with successive additions, uh, making the central courtyard inaccessible. The first approach consists in spending time inside the building to elaborate the diagnosis of the structure. The various alterations uh, that can be observed lead to a detailed analytical exploration. By understanding layer by layer, the building can be understood very precisely its logic of constructive assemblies on which the project can be based. 
A model is made to show the rhythm of the structure and the potential volumes it is capable of carrying. A plan or catalog of the different structural spaces was made also, and they are then adjusted in order, uh, in order to constitute a specific composition mode between serving and served spaces. The project brings a maximum of light into the, into the rooms uh, from the liberation of the structural void of the building. Second example is a small um, Fobo building made up of load-bearing brick facades with metal floors. The diagnosis allow, allows to analyze precisely what the building is made of. Uh, here, the existing plan shows the structural logic that determines a domestic scale. The starting point of the reflection is the ex nihilo research of the most compact serving spaces. In parallel with this exercise, the research focuses on highlighting the existing structural volumes free of all the secondary works. So the insulation, oops, the insulation and elevator are integrated, focusing on spatial and um, use efficiency. This work finally leads to the composition of a new plan offering fluidity and specific dimensioning of the rooms. And the main facade uh, has beautiful urban qualities punctuated by loved bays we conserved, which function by mimicry with those of the rest of the street. Oops, sorry. Second part. Um, the analysis of the, oops, sorry. The analysis of the typological distrib no, sorry. <laughs> this project includes the rehabilitation of a 1920-1930s uh, HBM building uh, comprising 468 dwellings in the east part of Paris. The analysis of the typological distribution shows an absence of large apartment types and the water rooms are grouped together because of the existence of a single duct in each apartment. The structural diagnosis and the survey allow to understand and intentionalize the project aiming at the concordance between the structural logic and the speciality. We see the possible modification to improve an apartment, rationalizing the organization of the service rooms and the distribution of the bedrooms by enlarging the living room. In order to preserve the materiality of the exterior facade and to improve thermal and acoustic comfort, it is proposed to insulate from the inside, you see in red. The landscaping project for the exterior spaces aims to increase the proportion of permeable and vegetated open ground. So the trees provide shade in the summer and the green strips preserve the privacy of the ground uh, floor units. The third project is essentially um, involving thermal rehabilitation of a 1968 grand ensemble of 344 dwellings in an occupied environment. The wall bear, uh, the building and the facade mostly constitute a plastically strong envelope. The diagnosis surveyed the different materials of the facade and cataloged its different uh, typical spans. Models were used to study the principles of the insula insulating envelope. And insulating from the outside aims at respecting the original drawings uh, and emphasizing the various depth of the facade. Their unitary aspect is preserved and its plasticity is even reinforced uh, by thicker reliefs whose light beautifully reveals the rhythm. Since the dwelling, uh, oops. The objective of this uh, project are energetic rehabilitation as well of a 9080 building and the creation of four new dwellings. Since the dwelling were occupied, the office worked with each inhabitant to solve inside specific problems. Oh, where am I? Sorry. 
the project search to imagine a light but complete intervention, including both the exterior insulation and the elevation. The main issue uh, was to link the existing and the elevation with the new envelope and its coating materiality. The new facade project includes framing of base, allowing to introduce a new and more harmonious design while affirming the horizontals, distinguishing each levels of housing. This materiality accounts for the superposition of added envelope and the recessed uh, elevated part. The last case is the rehabilitation of Grand Ensemble by Denis Honegger from 1957, built in the spirit of constructive rationalism, and the project involved finding an innovative solution to resolve the thermal bridges in order to preserve the original appearance of the building without disturbing the residents. The development of the, of the project was done in consultation with them. With the diagnosis of the structure, we understood uh, the interference of the framework of the speciality. The precise diagnosis uh, of the constructive system allowed the technical and architectural resolution on the thermal bridges and made it possible to discover unsuspected project potential in the thickness of the facade. Um, here, precisely. <coughs> The composition of the facade is maintained and should not change. Only the slight disorder are treated punctually. The main intervention is in, in inhabited dwellings involves the injection of insulation in the airspace, insulating cornice and baseboard and new, one, new wood joinery. The consultation with the tenants is a fundamental key to make the project with their approval. This includes a vote during the study phase based on uh, presentation of different solutions. The inhabitants, by their lived experience, often bring a complementary view to the diagnosis. The exchange consisted in explaining to them that we did not know what to do a priori, but what uh, we were looking for. The use of thermal cameras to target the major thermal bridges helped us to have a scientific and convincing proof to justify an insulation from the inside of the dwellings. This operation will soon be completed. It will have been able to increase the performance of the building without modifying the envelope and by intervening only in a targeted and fast way inside the dwellings whose inhabitants appreciate a significant gain in comfort. To conclude, I should say that through these interventions of various scales, we see that the rehabilitation project of ordinary buildings implies a rather fine part of creativity, which sometimes fades away, but always places in the foreground the valorization of the existing. Uh, we hope that the knowledge and the method resulting from this practice will be able to develop quickly, including by privileging biosourced materials, in order to answer the, uh, qualitatively, as qualitatively as possible the challenges posed by the emergency of the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I think uh, as, as announced, I think you, you see it immediately the connection with the practice and, and all the on all the limits. I think what I, I recall from your presentation is that you are very often referring to analysis and diagnosis. These are typical methodologies that we are using in heritage buildings. Uh, what was not so obvious, but I think it's also related to the type of examples is of course understanding what the values are and because it is very different according to the type of buildings uh, and you're specifically referring to heritage values it also constrains you in a, in a different way as the examples that you give um, at the same time i think as you as your conclusion is referring to i think it it, it requires new types of creativity and new ways of dealing with these realities and tailor-made solutions. I think it's also what you were referring to, so we can imagine industrialized proposals, but I think uh, many of the examples that you're giving are just uh, uh, giving room for, um, let's say, very tailor-made solutions, which are exactly the way also to deal with 
as you also referred to, unexpected findings uh, that could enhance, in fact, the preservation of the of, the, of those heritage buildings. It's also interesting that you, uh, we can debate about it maybe later on, that sometimes you say how you enhanced a number of things. Uh, and of course, it's interesting to then think about, do they enhance the heritage values or are they just new enhancement of architectural values, which is a little bit different, but I think it's an interesting debate in this context. Okay. Thank you very much. And then now we move to our female part of the panel, if I can say so. Um, and so we go to Joanna. Uh, so, Joanna, you are working now at the TU Delft, I understood, and you were at the architecture degree in Minho in uh, both institutes. I know very well, as well as the UNESCO chair, I think, where you have been working with uh, Anna Pereira, others, I think. So, I think you will be referring also to the practice of learning something from students. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, go. You have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, exactly. As Kun was uh, just briefly ex explaining, I will talk to you about learning from our students about what sustainable heritage is. Uh, and a, a, a quick introduction. So why do perceptions on sustainable heritage matter? Why do we care about this idea of perception? Uh, and as you know, the building sector uh, has a huge impact on sustainability. I think that's not new. We have been discussing it also yesterday and today in the previous presentations. But the building sector is responsible in Europe for one third of the waste produced in, the, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and only three to 4% of materials are reused. And there is these numbers that I think are quite scary from the Netherlands that in the year 2020, uh, around 12,000 buildings were demolished. Uh, and while this is not uh, immediately related to heritage, it's ab uh, about adaptive reuse of buildings. And these needs that we have to go as Andrew was putting yesterday in his presentation, going beyond the blah, 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 and the good intentions uh, for a sustainable uh, future. Uh, but why are these good intentions not implemented? To understand that, we need to understand how human behavior works. This is a simple model from the theory of planned behavior. If we look at psychology, uh, intentions are predictors of behaviors but behaviors depend also on perceptions of control in the perceptions of the norms and in the attitudes of the persons and the actors uh, implementing these behaviors and uh, my my phd that i will not uh, refer uh, right now but just to to give you an overview uh, demonstrated that attitudes are indeed uh, one of the most important aspects to determine what behaviors are implemented or not. So this means that uh, while norms and policies are really important, they are not enough to change uh, the practice of the future. And to change the practice of the future, we really need to understand attitudes. And that's why uh, I, in this research, in this study that I'm showing you today, uh, I used collages as a, as a generative technique to reach and understand better what are these attitudes of practitioners. And in the case, I use uh, design students as, as, a, as a case study. So first, we need to understand also what this difference between conscious and unconscious knowledge. Because knowledge, as, as you see in this example, is, is like an iceberg. Uh, we have conscious knowledge that is explicit, that is related to our logical and rational thinking. But we also have unconscious knowledge that is tacit and is about our beliefs, our values and our attitudes. And it's something that we don't access so easily. Uh, and to get to know these attitudes, uh, we need to, to understand the task performance and to not be aware of it. So I, I give this example of think of a piano player. If you ask them, how do you play the piano is really difficult to explain it in words, but in, they know how to do it, right? So it was a bit this type of knowledge that I wanted to access. And that's why I used the, the collages to, to do it. These are just the methodological steps. I will just be very brief. So there was a sensitizing booklet. Then there was a collage workshop with students uh, and then the content and thematic analysis that I will present today. Uh, I want to, to 
let you know also that the students were not taught about sustainable heritage before the collage exercise. So the idea was not to teach them and see if they learned it, but the idea is really to see what they already know uh, in their deeper beliefs. So this took place in October in the Faculty of Architecture with seven students of the Heritage and Architecture uh, Design Studio. So their first year with an heritage uh, specialization. Uh, and there uh, I proceed to a content and thematic analysis that I will now present to you. So the question that was posed to the students is what is sustainable heritage for you? And four main term themes emerged. So students were referring to heritage uh, only or to sustainability only. And uh, then to sustainable heritage, but in a smaller percentage of, of the mentions. Uh, and then uh, a very common uh, concept was the concept of reuse or using all over again. And uh, the narratives of the students in comparison also with the collages produced uh, show that heritage is perceived as something old. So when they mention heritage, they refer to old building, old castle, old church. Uh, they refer museums, they refer churches. They also refer to materials and uh, buildings. Of course, uh, I need to clarify this was an architecture school in the context of an uh, architecture studio. Um, in contrast, sustainability is perceived as something new. That is the most common word associated with sustainability. It's uh, also associated with development, with modern, a bit with nature, but mostly new, modern and development and, and also the future. So there is this contrasting perceptions on heritage and sustainability. So heritage is about people, uh, while sustainability is about the whole world. Heritage is about values, while sustainability is about technology. Heritage is about traditions, while sustainability is about future. Heritage is about memories, while sustainability is about artificial intelligence. But students are aware of this contrast between heritage and uh, sustainability and the need to link and connect these two fields. So a bit what Dorian was saying before of this connection of ecology and, and culture. So you see in this example, uh, the band-aids that the student used to connect these two worlds of new and old sustainable and heritage. Uh, and to do this connection, this bridge, these band-aids that we need is embracing new technologies. That is also a common topic in the different uh, presentations of the different students. To create what a student refers to as the Schwarzenegger building, uh, as a way of integrating technology, not just in the diagnosis and the surveying process, but also in uh, the renovation of these buildings so that they are more up to date. The concept of value is, is key. As this, as this student was mentioning, sustainable heritage creates new values, and that is cool. And if we look deeper into these concepts of, of values, we see that there is an extension from the traditional heritage values, such as age, historic, aesthetic, to a more integrative approach that considers sustainable values also, including the ecological, the economic, and the social. If you see in this uh, graphic here, uh, ecologic, economic, and social values represent almost 50% of the values referenced by the students in a way that uh, even points to a shift towards ecological values. You see in this example, uh, the student uh, was referring, so his sentence, as you, as you see in the, in the slide is, can a monument be destroyed to bring up another monument? And what he's questioning is, uh, you see in the, in the collage, is that there is this archeological site that was excavated, but he was questioning this idea of destroying an, a monument that is the natural site to excavate an archeological site. So there is a shift in their perceptions of, of values in, in, in relation to heritage. 
Reuse is the most mentioned action, as I pointed out in the beginning. Uh, other actions include, as, as you see, by far uh, the most mentioned action. Uh, but other actions include disassemble, connect, and change. Uh, sustainable heritage is understood as what is still there, so it's about durability, as, as Kun also mentioned before. Sustainable, uh, sustainable heritage is the one that is still there and is still used right now, so it still has a function and it still serves society. Even when we are not aware of it. And this student uh, in her collage started with this black corner that she says, I started with a void. Because sometimes we are not aware of our heritage, but it's still there. And to be aware of this heritage, they started also defining these attributes. What can heritage be? What are they talking about when they talk about heritage? Um, and they talk about the site in the relation with the environment. They talk about buildings, as I mentioned before, the churches, the castles, etc. But they also talk about building parts and components, such as the wall, the structure, the window or the door. Building materials like uh, the bricks or the wood uh, and the spirit of the place. So the relations with people, the memories uh, and uh, ideas. And understanding heritage in these multiple attributes also allows them to think in a very flexible uh, way. So they have this idea of anyone can change everything because it's really about seeing what is there and that we can change it. Uh, and in this example, the student points, uh, you see the, in the first image in the right, uh, the, it was a church, but then it was transformed as a school for children, but it's still the, the same building, but it was uh, transformed, but also at the level of the materials that can create a new composition. So one common idea in the different presentations is that sustainable heritage is not garbage. So is sustainable heritage is about preserving what is there to create something new. So from materials that could be trash, we can preserve them and create something new. And this is also heritage. So it's not just the traditional historical values, but also the ecological value of the materials and the embodied energy that is already there. And old buildings need to be repurposed so, so that they, again, do not become garbage. And to do that, students suggest that this assemble would be an important action to avoid waste. Uh, as you saw in the previous graphic before, this assemble was not one of the most used words that was reused for sure, uh, but it was very... Uh, crossing the different students. So in seven presentations, it came across the different presentations and it was a very common word. And this is about this idea that the buildings can be disassembled and that the parts can be used somewhere else, depending, of course, on the different uh, values that, that they have. And that would allow us to achieve a circular sustainable heritage, because sustainable heritage for these students is the, the heritage that is circular and that is durable. So lessons learned from the analysis of uh, these collages. Heritage and sustainable, they share a common goal. And you see in this uh, image with the three persons in the distance, that is about this long time from generation to generation and the transmission of resources for the future. Some principles uh, that can be extracted from, from this analysis uh, the need to extend traditional heritage values from social, ecological and economic values need to be integrated in the heritage discourses. Uh, the uh, need to embrace new technologies to empower heritage buildings, as I mentioned, not just in the serving phase, but also for the sustainable heritage management in, in the long term. Uh, the possibility of reusing existing buildings, but not necessarily only as a whole, but also its parts and its materials. And that can be achieved through this assembly of building parts so that they can be used for a long time. And also the importance of generating new values through new functions that serve the social changes uh, of, of society.
And so there is much more to sustainability and to sustainable heritage than energy. Uh, what this means is that is also not, uh, I, I wanted to finish with this one, because if we work uh, with attitudes of people instead of against them, we can uh, achieve change easier and, and faster by finding opportunities instead of problems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. A lot of information that you have shared with us, and I think a very systematic uh, way. Let me just recall a few uh, things which are interesting to me, uh, is um, the fact that sometimes we lack understanding the values. Uh, that was the black corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, at a certain moment, I suggested uh, in Leuven that before we, di we dismantle <laughs> or we, we destroy a building, that we should organize a funeral. Uh, the point is that that's the only way sometimes people realize what's there. And so mm -hmm. very often people see heritage disappearing, and it's only when it's away yeah. that they figured out that it's away. And so I think it's important to sensibilize this, and, I, and that brings us back to one of the last um, conclusions that you gave is about, uh, yes, you, you have to find new ways to integrate it in actual society. And, and, and that's the way how you get the brains and the people and the love of the people to deal with that and to give it a future. And so I think it's uh, very interesting what you shared with us. Okay, time is running, so let's go to Natalie Vernimme. Uh, she's an art historian working for the Flemish agency uh, dealing with uh, cultural heritage, which should say immovable cultural heritage, because we make these kind of differences in uh, Flanders. Um, and so every little thing will help us. That's what your message is, no? Yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, I will tell you a bit more about the research-based policy measures to reduce CO2 emissions of protected houses in Flanders. Uh, first, a bit more about uh, the institution where I work, Flanders Heritage Agency. It's a, a government agency that is responsible for uh, immovable heritage, as Kuhn said. So buildings, landscapes, archaeological sites and the heritage fleets, but not movable heritage and not intangible heritage. We are also a Flemish scientific institute, which is rather special in a, a regional uh, government agency. What do we do? Um, we prepare and implement heritage policy. We research and protect heritage values. We assist the management of protected immovable heritage with uh, advice and with grants. And we accredit and subsidize heritage partners and actors. What are Flanders' ambitions in the light of climate change? Uh, the goals for this were set in the Flemish Long-Term Renovation Strategy for Buildings 2015. The goal for 2050 is a reduction of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for buildings with more than 80% compared to 2020. Goals were set for residential buildings uh, and for non-residential buildings, but which is rather special, there was a separate section uh, for protected buildings. And it said we will determine a long-term objective that is achievable and desirable with respect for heritage values, and we will develop adapted tools and interventions. Facing this task, what are now the policy instruments to reduce CO2 emissions of protected buildings? We have three types of instruments. We have financial instruments, research and best practices, and guidance instruments. The financial instruments, uh, there are two. First of all, we have the heritage loan that is intended for uh, interventions to improve the sustainability and energy performance of protected buildings and buildings included in the established inventory. It's a loan with a low interest rate of 1% uh, for an amount between 25 and 250,000 euros and for a fixed term of uh, between 3 and 20 years. And the own contribution amounts up to at least 20% of the total investments. Next to this, this, we have also two types of heritage grants. One is intended for the development of an energy audit for heritage buildings. It's for protected buildings, buildings in a transition zone, and buildings in a heritage landscape. 
This specific energy audit uh, is based on uh, the European norm guidelines for improving the energy performance of historic buildings. The grant amounts to 80% of the accepted cost estimate with a maximum of 25,000 euros. And then we have another type of grant intended for adaptations to the windows, because windows, we, we find this is something very typical for historical buildings, and we want to preserve that. And also to the extra cost of certain adaptations necessary to facilitate retrofits. For example, uh, secondary windows, secondary glazing, special replacement glazing, or also adaptations of walls in order to make roof insulation possible. Then the second type of policy, policy measures uh, consists of research and best practices. I will uh, tell you something about uh, our own projects, uh, energy saving measures and protected houses, and also uh, about an international uh, project where we part participated, deep renovation of historic buildings towards nearly zero energy buildings. The own projects, um, energy saving measures and protected houses, uh, it dates from 2060, and it was a combination of research and a living lab in seven monuments with, with residential function owned by private owners. This is uh, very important. We wanted to test the methodology of the energy audit for historic buildings, uh, for heritage buildings, and we also wanted to evaluate the feasibility and the impact of various retrofit measures. What came out of this project, uh, we had some lessons learned about the process. We saw that owners need a lot more guidance. We also saw that owners underestimate the investment cost of retrofit measures in protected houses. Considering the energy audits, we saw that uh, air, tightness, uh, air tightness measurements before interventions are um, often not very useful. And then considering the measures, installation of roofs and adaptations to windows were almost always possible with respect for heritage values, but insulation of walls was less evident. Uh, what we learned from our own projects, we brought it in, uh, the international project, deep renovation of historic buildings towards nearly zero energy buildings. That was a project of the International Energy Agency with more than 20 organizations from 13 countries. The project leader was Eurac, uh, Eurakis. What was the output of this project? Uh, an assessment and proposal for improvement of the European norm. Um, and uh, this, uh, the output was a handbook with uh, planning to plan energy retrofits of historic buildings based on the European norm. Uh, another output was a database uh, with more than 60 best practice examples for sustainable renovation of historic and traditional buildings. Uh, I su suggest to look at it. It's really uh, very interesting and a lot of information is uh, in this database, also technical information. And another output was a tool with more than 150 conservation compatible retrofit solutions from all of Europe to help practitioners find the perfect solutions for the conservation of their own historic building. The last type of instrument is guidance instruments. Um, we developed a guideline in 2013 for owners to retrofit historic houses with the do's and the don'ts and also best practice examples. And following the uh, research project that we did, uh, we developed um, assess retrofit assessment frameworks. Uh, it consists of a decision tree that guides owners to make the best selection of solutions for retrofit interventions in their house. Uh, we developed uh, these frameworks for roof insulations, for solar energy, for historic windows, for installations, and also for insulations of walls and floors. Um, these uh, assessment frameworks give a bit an insight in the thinking process of heritage consultants, because we saw that owners uh, often did not uh, understand why a heritage consultant said, yes, you can do this, or no, you can't do this. And with this retrofit assessment say, uh, frameworks, it became visible for them how uh, we made a decision. 
Another project is the Energy Consultants for Immovable Heritage project. It ran from 2040 till 2021 and uh, from WTCB that uh, uh, did it for us. Uh, it was a project uh, in the Flemish Climate Fund. This was a financial framework that draws on revenues from the auction of European emission allowances under the EU ETS. The fund made it possible to implement climate policy measures in order to reach greenhouse emission, emission reduction targets. We developed a project to do something about the limited knowledge at that time in 2014 about heritage-friendly retrofit measures by architects. The goal was to gather data on case studies of refurbishments of historic buildings and also to develop a formation for energy consultants specific for heritage buildings. The results, uh, an energy desk was installed where restoration architects could be helped with technical questions. Uh, more than 60 advices were given. Uh, secondly, a five-day training course was developed um, for uh, heritage professionals to become specialized energy consultants. Uh, we reached uh, 76 architects, 83 other uh, professionals, and now the modules are uh, online. And the last online session that was given, uh, more than uh, 1,300 building professionals uh, attended it. And then also a database uh, was set up uh, with monitored cases, and uh, you can find it online, and there are 10 cases and monitoring data. And then the last uh, project is an ongoing uh, project, tailored heritage energy advice. Uh, we conducted a study uh, on the feasibility of an energy prestation certificate for protected houses. Uh, the adapted parameters were mapped, also a set of heritage-friendly retrofit recommendations were developed, and uh, two workable solutions uh, to define an energy target for the protected houses were set up. They were also tested on 10 representative cases. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the policy decision uh, was that we would not develop a special EPC because the cost and the efforts for the further development of this were disproportionate uh, to the limited target group of owners of protected heritage. Instead, we will, develop a uh, we will develop a tailored heritage energy advice, and this service will be offered to owners in the second half of 2023. Some conclusions. The core message is uh, that adapted policy measures are needed in order to retrofit our built heritage and transmit heritage values to the next generations. But we have a lot of remaining challenges. We need to continue the search for technical solutions to retrofit historical structures with respect for the heritage value and also uh, the search for effective and simple tools to support owners in the greening of their heritage building. There is also a need for upscaling and exchange of best practices and innovative research results on an international level. And instead of putting the main focus on energy and efficiency, more focus is needed in policy and in regulations on the sustainable use and reuse of heritage, heritage elements and historic materials, as well as responsible recycling of materials. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. So I, I think what is interesting here is that you have a, a perspective from, from an agency. So it's looking at what, what kind of support can we provide. I think it also stresses basically on the, the tailor-made solutions. Uh, I think there is not something, uh, a solution that fits uh, all kinds of problems. And also specifically, I think the, the fact that you have to, or that uh, support is needed and provided uh, for professionals uh, so that they can diversify their 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 way of, of, of identifying uh, possible solutions. I think that's very often uh, lacking. And um, yeah, maybe that one of the things that indirectly we have sometimes been discussing as well is that uh, it may be sometimes also be a good solution to bring people together who have same problems and to, to create communities of owners uh, sometimes can be also an addition of value because it is not only giving solutions, but it's also making people aware about the things that they are putting or investing in. Okay, I, I realize that we have reached just exact 10 o'clock uh, and that there is not, not a lot of time for questions. I don't know how practically it could work. Um, if maybe there is an urgent question, I know that there are also people online. 
I don't know if we got some questions online. We didn't get questions online, so then we have more time for people questioning here. Um, I don't know if there is an urgent question um, that you would like to ask or... Uh, yep, there is one there at the end. Yeah, just you will have the microphone, so then uh, people will... Thank you very much. Is it, can you hear me? Yeah. My, uh, Alison Heritage from ECROM. I just, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of you for these really fantastic presentations and the work that you're doing. Um, and I, but in particular, I wanted to thank Joanna and also you, Conrad, <laughs> for your emphasis also that sustainability isn't just about environmental sustainability, that it's also about social sustainability. And it seems to me that there's a, that we have developed very good ways of, of actually measuring and evidencing the environmental impacts. But I think that there is more that needs to be done also to look at the social impacts of um, adaptive reuse and, you know, sustainable mm -hmm. um, uh, ways and means with buildings. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if uh, you would like to comment on that. I think it's a really important point as well, because it's about transparency and it's about who's benefiting from these actions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know if somebody wants to, or Jana, you want to, to start with saying something about it? Thank you for your kind words in the first place. <laughs> and thank you for, for bringing this uh, topic, because indeed we tend to think sustainability about energy for the simple reason that is measurable and is really easy to, to make the calculation. I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's possible and feasible. And social sustainability is not uh, that simple to understand how it can be measured. Of course, I, I can talk from my experience in, in education and indeed the students are more interested actually in focusing on social sustainability than they are in the topics of energy. And energy is really an important one. I'm not saying that we don't need to talk about energy, but we also need to consider uh, other aspects. And for instance, user experience and part public participation. So we try that with our students that they are aware of that and we try to bring them challenges in in the design studios that include different stakeholders yeah but mm. it's, an, it's an academic experiment for now but i really have hopes for the future because these students that we are teaching and training right now are the practitioners of of the future so if they are already aware of that it it seems to me that there is a generational change and that we are moving in the in the good direction thank you but if somebody else wants to to join here the debate that's so about also the question about who benefits <laughs> and what what is the benefit i i maybe have a a slightly different uh, question also to you Anna. i, I mm -hmm. thought it was a really very very interesting uh uh presentation and it it gives uh, food for thought uh and one of my questions is uh you did uh, the exercise with uh students do you think that the outcome would be different if you do it with uh for instance normal citizens owners of heritage buildings um i don't know Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question. I think in, indeed it would be different with different target groups. And I think that's why it's so important. Uh, I'm a believer in this methodology and in this way of approaching it to understand the attitudes of people and what they think and what they care about. Uh, so I think we should do it with different target groups. In this case, we did it with students because we are designing new heritage studios and we want that to be a, a reflection of what they are looking what they are looking for so for the next semester we are planning to offer a heritage design studio focused on the 100% reuse so no waste uh, no waste heritage studio in order to fit these needs that they they show in these type of uh, exercises but i think it's it's really important to do it with different uh, stakeholders and to also understand in a larger scale and at an european level uh, what the practitioners want and what do they value what do they think sustainable heritage is to understand if there is a mismatch in the current policies because 
right now we don't really know what people think about it. We know that they have to implement certain standards because, well, that's what the policies give them and guidelines, but we don't know how they feel about it and how they accept it internally. So I think it would be really useful to mm. do it at the larger, the larger scale. I think so too. <laughs> Anybody want to, you want to join? Yes, so we have the discussion. Otherwise, I think we have to respect a little bit the time. Uh, let me just uh, say something as a kind of a conclusion, maybe a little bit strange, maybe. If you go back to the question here is about who, who, who benefits, uh, very often we are talking about real estate agents. And if you ask them, the, the worst thing they, they see forward is just demolish and make something new. What, what Joanna is referring to, and I think indirectly the question of Natalie, was about, in fact, looking at co-creation. And sometimes we underestimate the fact that the existing fabric is the best way to co-create. It's very difficult to co-create something new which is not there. And so the social aspect of co-creation with people contributing to their well-being is exactly dealing with the existing instead of erasing. And I think that adds to this discussion about not limiting ourselves to carbon dioxide. So just, just as a kind of a small reflection at the end, I think we have to close up here. And then I thank uh, the speakers and the contributors for their very interesting contribution. And uh, I think there will be plenty of time to discuss afterwards on coffee and other nice things. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you very much. We believe in your stakeholders. <laughs> <laughs>